We're going to bring up Russ Bradbird. Good morning to you, Russ. Hi, Michael. Hi, Katie. It's Hi, great Russ. to have you here. You know, uh, Russ has been a, a guest on this show a number of times. We talk about similar topics, but we get more information out of him every time we bring him on. Uh, we don't know when Russ first showed up at the Heartland. He what? was playing basketball at North Park. Uh, he was a member of one of their... Uh, NC2A championship teams. Uh, he went on to become a crude recruiter of great basketball talent. Did you say a crude recruiter? Groovy recruiter. Oh, groovy. Uh, who got Jeez. Penny Hardaway to the Bulls eventually. Wow. Uh, and Russ worked with not only Lou Henson at New Mexico State, but uh, Haskins down there at UTEP. And uh, he's been around the Southwest since, but recently he got himself a little crib here in Chicago and brought his wonderful wife Connie and his daughter Alma back to the city here for the summers. It's great to be back, Mike. First, I want to say I had a wonderful breakfast, as usual, <laughs> but also Fruitland Jackson, man, that guy what is a great. Treat, huh? Unbelievable. Yeah, let's he hear it for Fruitland, Fruitland one more Jackson. time. Incredible. Yes. Incredible. Well, you bring up the wonderful breakfast, Russ, but I got to tell you, you were the center of some controversy recently. Uh, uh, we were tightening up the menu for the summer so that we can, with more people here, we can get the food out faster. And one of the things that was about to be taken off the menu was the three scoops because they were going to cut the tuna out. Now, we know there's some ethical issues around tuna, and we're dealing with them and looking at them, but the three scoops remains. That's hummus guacamole and tuna. Well, that was, was, was not what I had this morning, but um, I'm happy to hear that. Okay, good. <laughs> so, Russ, you, uh, you've you been on the East Coast. You were not only in the Southwest recently. You've traveled around. Um, one of the things that you do on a yearly basis is, in honor of Rocky Galarza, you started a camp in El Paso called Basketball in the Barrio. It's in the Segundo Barrio, and it's a camp that kids pay a dollar to go for three days, learn basketball skills, border culture. Uh, they learn a lot more than basketball. And uh, you've been doing it for a long time. Uh, it's connected to Athletes United for Peace, and I didn't get to go this year, so if, I if want If I you heard to Michael say that once, I heard him say that about 50 times. I'm not going to bas basketball in the barrio. It was hard for him. I know, it was hard for all of us. Uh, yeah. Mike is off in the camp I got a lot of emails. But we've been doing it for almost 20 years, wow. Michael, and, and for a dollar, every kid gets a, a t-shirt and a, a basketball and a bilingual children's book and a peace poster. And this year's poster was John Carlos, the 1968 Olympian who raised his, his black gloved fist, uh, sort of an iconic image in American culture. So John Carlos came and spoke to the kids oh, this year. And oh, just, nice. by, just by coincidence, That's before fabulous. the music tomorrow night, your listeners can go hear John Carlos speak at the uh, Socialist Convention out at the Crown Plaza Airport, uh, you know, the O'Hara Airport, tomorrow at 7.30. Uh, so I'm going to do that. Go hear him speak tomorrow. Wow. T John Carlos, tomorrow night at 7.30. Zip back to the heartland. Oh, you're going to come back for the, uh, the Grateful Dead. The Tree of Liberty folks. <laughs> Unbelievable. But Starship. If, if I can still get a guys. ticket. I don't know. It might be hard to get a ticket. We'll get you in, Russ. So camp was good this year. Camp was great, and, and John Carlos really added a lot. It was a different dimension. He talked to the, the kids briefly, but we had him talk to the coaches, and he wound up talking to the coaches for an hour and a half about uh, how sports can be used as a way to change the world. He's really an interesting guy with a long history. Well, it's great that he's getting some acknowledgement from a lot of people because for you know a number of years, these guys were pretty shut out of the track and field industry, so to speak. That's right, and he was, uh, he was a pariah for a long time for, for taking a stand and you know last night I went and saw Dave Zirin's new movie uh, Not Just a Game and in the movie he talked about uh, you know there was an example of Michael Jordan when he won his Olympic gold medal he draped the American flag over his Reebok logo on his because he's with Nike he had to protect his corporate investment mm. and uh, whereas John Carlos raised a black glove fist for civil rights everywhere uh, it's quite a stark difference, and the movie pointed that out is really sort of uh, stunning. And of course, in a, in a Chicago audience, it got everyone's attention in Chicago, uh, the Michael Jordan bit. Well, the other thing being that the historical context of that fist raising in Mexico City, mere days after uh, thousands had been uh, chased out and Shot, hundreds had been killed. killed in the streets of Mexico City as they were fighting for their rights, mostly young people, in, in that incredible and pivotal year of 1968. And 
the Black Power salute was uh, not only a brave thing to do, but I mean, thank heavens he did it, and that both of them did it, because it was uh, so needed at that games to remind people of the rest of the world outside of. That's right, and especially at a time, you know, track and field was much more popular at that time, right? And there was less less sporting events on television at the time, and so the whole you know the whole world really was watching when when John Carlos and Tommy Smith uh, uh, made that gesture. Right. Uh, Russ, one of the things that I always like to ask you about, because you're right there on the scene, is uh, life on the border. Uh, you've been in and around El Paso, living up in Las Cruces these days, teaching at New Mexico State. Uh, when I used to go down to basketball in the barrio, as you know, I took a lot of photographs on both sides of the border. And the last couple of years I went down, not only do I not have a passport, but uh, people just aren't going across the border as, as much as they did, uh, which has been too bad in many ways for uh, both sides of the border, I think. But what's your take on the situation down there and people's attitudes? Well, uh, El Paso is a... A precursor, I guess, is the word of things to come. It's, uh, you know, we're an international world, and uh, that's a place where people of different backgrounds cross over and for many years did so. Yeah. Well, as you know, Mike, El Paso sits right on the border of Mexico. Juarez, Juarez is the sister city. Now, Juarez at one time was about 1.6 million, and El Paso is about 800,000. So it's the largest international population in the world, uh, lar largest population in the world on an international border. Hmm. Uh, and in the last, uh, just in the last 10 years, there have been over 30,000 murders in Juarez, maybe eight or 9,000, uh, sorry, 30,000 in Mexico, maybe, maybe 9,000 in Juarez, and 3,000 in the last year, including 120 policemen, unsolved murders of policemen. It's, it's total lawlessness and the breakdown of, uh, of the social order. And it's, in my view, and in the view of a lot of people in, on the border, it's fueled by the United States drug policy, where most of the drugs coming through what is, uh, uh, is the marijuana trade. And, the, uh, and so, uh, you know, I think clearly to people on our, in my camp that if you legalized marijuana, you would have the, the profits of the drug trade would plummet. Uh, now, there was a New York Times editorial last week saying, yeah, but that's only 60 or 70 percent. I think as, a, you know, you're a businessman, if you chopped 60 or 70 percent of someone's business, it would, it would drastically change things. And one of the other odd things about WADA is that people don't know, there's three high schools in WADA for 1.5 million people, or what is now down to a million people. Three? Three high schools. And so when you're, when you're 14, unless you can afford a, uh, unless you can afford one of the the many uh, high dollar private schools if, you're, if your father happens to own a, 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 a twin plant. But uh, you know, what are kids gonna do? They, they graduate from high school or, or graduate from eighth grade uh, more accurately and what do they do then? And, and the, you know, running drugs has is, is become a, bi a big thing. And one of, the, one of the myths is that the, it's all cartels and sort of high dollar Miami Vice kind of stuff, but it's your average kid on the street that's involved in it now. And, and, and that's who's doing the shooting and killing is the just kids on the street over, over money and turf. This is the most tragic reality of our world today is the lack of opportunity or what, what the world looks like to not just the Mexican teenagers coming out of uh, eighth grade, but all over the world, kids that age, particularly in the developing countries, W that do not see a future. That's right. And, uh, and, and, and it is a stark and terrifying reality of, of this world that if we don't change that, we're not going to change anything. Right. And, and no kid, as you know, Katie, no kid in, in Juarez, Mexico grows up and says, I think I'd like to get involved in the drug trade someday. Right. And there's nowhere in the United States where anyone has said, geez, you know, drugs have not come in this week. We're, we're stuck for months now without drugs. It's just, just the, the, drug, the, drug, the drug war has been a total and utter failure. And in, in Mexico now, in, in, in Juarez especially, it's not the war against drugs, it's the war for drugs. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, it's the battle to see who will control the money and who will control the turf. And, and the reason that there, there's so much profit is because of U.S. policy. Well, you know, uh, often on this show, or every now and then, we do what we call the reefer report, and we'll... Uh, talk about the laws that are going on and challenges and medical marijuana changes. Uh, recently, uh, President Carter uh, 
came forth with a, uh, a really a bold statement that just said that the war on drugs has been a failure, and he called for the legalization of marijuana. Yeah, well, I mean, it's William F. Buckley did. It's not like you have to be a, you know, a, it's, not like it's, it's not like you have to be Abby Hoffman to be calling for it anymore. I mean, people on, on all sides of the issue, and especially law enforcement, realize Abby Hoffman gave me drugs for my wedding present. <laughs> and there the you day. have it, Michael's story on that one. <laughs> Actually, I could tell you another Abby Hoffman story. He's, he lit up a joint right here in this room. And we had to get him to put it I out. I had to tell him, Abby, Abby, this is Chicago. We have a license. Could you do that where everyone else does outside? He didn't. He lit up. All right, you're listening to Live from the Heartland. Uh, this is Katie Hogan and Michael James. We're talking to Russ Bradbird. I want to just uh, put out a word of thanks to two technical guys who work with a big telephone company, uh, a guy named Mike and a guy named Lenny, who, uh, as many of you know who listened last week, we were not broadcast live. We had some technical difficulties, and uh, we worked those. <laughs> some of that was paying our bill something, late. Something but then, technical. once again, when we got the it all hooked up, it... Uh, uh, we were having a lot of trouble yesterday, and I spent uh, many hours on the phone with these two fellows who really walked me through our Zephyr board here and got the SPID numbers programmed in. So we got Angel at the board on one end, and we got Eli on the board at the other end, and we are broadcasting live from the stage at I, the Heartland I wanna Cafe. Amen. I want to amen that thank you to AT&T yesterday. They worked, they worked hard, and Both Michael worked hard. Both union guys. Um, Back to our friend here, Russ. Russ, you talked to me about the film you saw la last night, um, Dave Zirin's film, and uh, particularly uh, we were talking about women in sports. Um, could you share uh, some of the things that we were sharing earlier before the show started about uh, what you learned from uh, the Zyron film last well, night? Well, like like every, all of us at the table, you know, Dave Zyron might be 35 years old, and uh, you know I'm, I'm old enough to be his father, but I've learned so much from this guy. He's, he's, he's relentless in his research, but what he does is he connects the dots in, uh, in sports, especially professional sports and college sports in this country, and sort of this pattern of uh, militarism and, and uh, disregard for, for human rights and women's rights and that kind of thing. The film is an hour long. It's called not, it was called Not not just a game, and it's been shown all over the country to high school kids. Evidently, it's through the uh, educational media project or something like that. But one of the th one of the things that, uh, that th one of the things that the film uh, talks about is that when, when I was in high school in the 70s, it was one out of 30 girls was playing sports. Today, it's one out of three, thanks to Title IX. Amen. That's an amazing. That's amazing progress. Yet the uh, television broadcasts of these sports 10 years ago. It was 10% of sports broadcasts were women's sports. Today, it's closer to 1%. In this last year, it's closer to 1%, below 2% of, of, of sporting events. This is with three or four ESPN channels. And so there's this odd, as more and more girls are playing sports, less and less women's sports are being shown on television. It's an odd phenomenon. Why do you think that is? Well, David, the, movie? the movies, the movie, uh, what the movie, the case, the movie... Uh, makes what the main movie makes a good case for is that uh, the American male view of sports is women's bodies, and so if it's beach volleyball and swimsuits, that's okay. But if it's a powerful woman uh, hitting a great softball, yeah, or or, 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 or kicking a, kicking a goal in soccer, or, or handling a basketball like it's a yo-yo. Uh, that's that's less appealing to the sort of the macho viewers and and and, and advertisers than than the, uh, there's a, there's an idea that that women you know that women are supposed to be uh, there, there's an idea of what feminism and what a woman's role is supposed to be and and women pro, women pro sports clearly shatters that role except that they're not being seen anymore. Well, you know uh, there was just some recent news about I think it's in soccer women's federation of soccer or some national thing where they. They, they kicked the either I think the Iranian team out of uh, competition because they wore uh, they didn't wear the right foxy clothes, and then uh, there was also some real public stuff about uh, trying to. Uh, make the outfits more enticing to uh, people for television I purposes. just want to say, yuck. <laughs> well, with a capital yuck. Y. It's I've a, had it with this. Uh, it's a funny and thing. And I mean, all of us have observed, all women who do sports have observed exactly what you just said. Oh yeah, if you can wear the teeniest bikini ever, even though you're six foot tall and you can slam a spike better than anybody, that, the reason you're on TV 
is that you're underdressed. Yeah. Well, if, if, I if, just can't stand it. Maybe uh, something that your listeners. I'm gonna go bang my head against the wall. So, 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 something well, your listeners might remember might remember is uh, <laughs> the, the NCAA championship games this year. The men's game was UConn against Butler, and I had to like prop toothpicks in over my eyes to keep my eyes open. It was such a boring game. But then the women's game, the Texas A&M women's game, it was that was an incredible game. Yeah, it was. It was just a much better game. And uh, but but uh, national television seems to be sort of missing the boat on this kind of thing. Even as it, I remember, Michael, when I was in in college, you'd go to a Grateful Dead show and there'd be a hundred thousand people there, but you never heard the Grateful Dead on the radio. It was as though the media had not caught up to what what human beings were up to. And I think it's the same with women's sports when so many women are playing sports. And uh, but, but if you if you watch television, you'd never know that. Actually, just. Just to inject, we will probably have the quarterback of the force, the women's football team, Chicago women's football team, which has a 9-0 and record on this radio show next Saturday morning. I've seen them. They play at Winnemac Park, don't they? And they're going to play Winnemac Boston Park? next week. Yeah. They're into the second round, and uh, they're doing great. And uh, They were here yesterday nourishing themselves. Yeah, they come in regularly. Well, that was just one of the the, 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 the women's issue was just one of many issues within this one hour film. I mean, it was Pat Tillman and uh, gay athletes. And, what did Pat and, Tillman have to say? Well, Pat Tillman hasn't said anything in a long time, right. but, but, but uh, you know, just the idea that the U.S. Army, the U.S. military used him as sort of their poster boy, right. and even in his death, rather than admitting a terrible mistake was made. They tried to, he, again, even in his death, he became used as a poster boy. And so uh, really a disturbing, you know, because he was a professional athlete that walked away from from uh, pro football, uh, but had changed his, his views or had really evolved. And even John Krakauer, his biographer, uh, uh, in the recent recent book, Where Men Seek Glory, uh, sort of pointed that out. So Till, Tillman was, was pretty amazing, but also the, how sports has been used to shatter the color barrier and, and, and move civil rights forward in this country was a big topic in the movie. Well, Russ, you, uh, speaking of writing, you are a uh, hell of a writer. And, uh, you know, your first book, uh, Patty on the Hardwood, uh, was a story of your uh, odyssey in Ireland where you were not only coaching the Tralee Tigers to a uh, losing to season and then to the national championship of Ireland. But you also were hanging out with Patty Jones, who's been on this show and on this stage, uh, thanks to you. And uh, you learned the fiddle, and uh, you didn't want to bring your fiddle today. But uh, it's a great book. I was honored to have taken the photographs you included. And uh, then you wrote another book, which is really one of the most wonderful books I ever read, particularly around civil rights. It's like civil rights through basketball. And that's called 40 Minutes of Hell. It's the extraordinary life of Nolan Richardson. Nolan Richardson happens to come out of the Segundo Barrio in El Paso, uh, black kid in a Mexican neighborhood, goes on to play at UTEP, uh, went on, became a famous coach at Arkansas, had some controversy, and now he's coaching the Oklahoma City... Uh, well, Tulsa, the Tulsa. Tulsa Shock of the WNBA. Tulsa Shock. So tell us about your those two books briefly, where they're at, how they're doing, and then you got to tell us what you're doing now. What are you writing about? Well, just, uh, you know, just as Fruitland Jackson is sort of the living bridge between Robert Johnson so that kids can l learn about Robert Johnson... Uh, Nolan Richardson was the living bridge between the black coaches who never got a chance at the historically black colleges and even like the great high school coaches in Chicago that would have never gotten a chance uh, because of the color of their skin. Well, Nolan Richardson was sort of the living bridge. He was one of the first to get a chance, and not only did he get a chance, he did incredibly well. He, he went to three Final Fours at Arkansas and won the national championship. And so his his life story is, 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 an, is an amazing story. He grew up a Spanish speaker in the barrio of El Paso. And so he's, I mean, in a way, you could make the case that he's just as Mexican as he is black, but really a guy who knocked down doors and, and, and opened up, uh, you know, I think coaches today, have to, have to, if you're a basketball coach, you can be less concerned about the color of your skin than you would have had to have been 10 or 20 or 30 years ago. But you know what I tell people? 
Katie, is the real impact for Nolan Richardson, if you want to understand Nolan Richardson's impact, the real place to look is in college football, where there's still 1% of the coaches are African American. College football has not had their Nolan Richardson yet. They're still waiting for a Nolan Richardson type figure to come along and break down doors like like the, like he did, Nolan Richardson did in college basketball. You are listening to Live from the Heartland, WLUW 88.7 FM on your dial, Chicago Sound Alliance. We are here every Saturday morning with fascinating, intelligent folks doing inspiring interviews like this guy, Russ Bradbury. Okay, Russ, so uh, you got two books out. Uh, both of them are available in the Heartland General Store. In fact, you get, can get autographed copies of the Nolan Richardson biography. And, uh, but you have been writing a, a series of short stories, and I'm sure you have plans on publishing some more books. You are a professor of, of creative writing at uh, New Mexico State, uh, and you're there along with your wonderful wife, Connie, who is one hell of a poet. And uh, I'd like to know what you're working on, because... Uh, are we getting beeped every time you say that? Go ahead. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure, but, but <laughs> that passed over me. <laughs> but uh, well, first, Mike, on the side, I have a little side job these days. I write for Slam Magazine. If listeners are under 30, they know Slam Magazine, but anyone over 30 doesn't seem to know. It's a basketball magazine. It's the largest ba uh, circulation of a basketball magazine in the world, but it sort of targets hip-hop culture. It's a much more urban kind of uh, chic magazine than, say, Sports Illustrated or ESPN Magazine, uh, which, by the way, they, they uh, Kate, a study in 2001, you'll be happy to hear this, uh, Sports Illustrated had one cover of their 52 issues that had a wom wom women on it, besides Besides the swimsuit issue, was the Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders issue in 2001. Yeah. Every other issue had a had a had a male athlete on the cover. But I write for Slam Magazine, which pays great respect to women basketball players. Kind of a street level magazine, and so I'm, I'm working on a piece now we about get it here. about yeah. Lorenz and Wright. Lorenz and Wright is uh, was the uh, Memphis Grizzlies player that got murdered a year ago, and the case is cold. No one has any idea who killed Lorenz and Wright, but he was broke. Ban uh, bankrupt and divorced. As it turned out from my research on this piece for Slam magazine, learned that uh, it's actually a typical story that more than half of uh, NBA players are bankrupt by the time they're, they're five years out of the league. And a, a big part of the reason is that they have these entourages because of their generosity. They say, well, I've got to take care of the guys I came up with. These are guys I've known since high school. They're my boys. You know, I've got to take care of my boys. And so these guys have entourages. And then when the, when the salary dries up for the main guy, unless it did for Lorenz and Wright. Suddenly, he's got you know their blood dry. Yeah, he's got he's got ten guys and and six kids, and who's you know where's the money going to come from? And so that's actually a typical, a tragic and typical story of uh, uh, of uh, the, the financial stress on these guys that you think that they're just all living this lifetime of, of be, being a millionaire, but they've got a lot more people to take care of than themselves. Do, can I just ask uh, the um this week, the basketball got locked out. What, what do we, is there any significance for uh, the level of attention you pay to sports? Well, I learned last night at the socialism convention that we're on the side of the players. No surprise, no surprise there. <laughs> right. But that most NBA teams, uh, 22 of the 30 NBA teams claim to not be making money. And so one of the things that's interesting, the, the owners now are taking sort of a socialistic attitude and they're asking for... Uh, they're asking to be guaranteed that they wouldn't lose money each year, which is a funny thing for a business owner to to ask to say, "I want to be guaranteed that it." But you know, and, and tell and, me who you ask for that because um, well, the players, you know, I'd like to ask that question. They, they want the players to give money back, and oh. so it's so it's an odd thing. You know, no one comes to uh, NBA games to see the front office personnel, but the the first thing that gets brought up is is the, the players do. Many of the players make astronomical salaries, but. Your typical player only lasts three years in the NBA. Same in the NFL. Yeah. And three and a half years, and, uh, you know, you need four years to get your pension. And both yeah. of them are in the, these lockout situations as we speak. That's that, that's right. But, I mean, my, my impulse would be to side with labor. You know, for many years, the players were, were totally underpaid, and no one ever goes to a Brad Pitt movie and says, I'm never going to another Brad Pitt movie again. The guy's making $10 million a year. It's not fair. Uh, you know, it's outrageous. And so I, I do think that there's a, a you, you know, it's, it seems to me that when, when inner city black 
young men are making a lot of money, that seems to rile people up. But if they were making money in the stock market on, on Wall Street, what they would be able to do is if they gained or lost millions of dollars, they'd have another chance they could regenerate themselves in the business. Might even get a taxpayer bailout. That's, that's right. But, but the, the, the unfortunate thing for these athletes is that by the time 10 years are over, their career is shot and they have no, they have no chance of ever, of ever regenerating their athletic career. Uh, Russ, didn't you just go to a sports writers uh, conference or a sports uh, story conference? Well, I went to the other, in every year, Michael, you'd love this organization. There's about 30 of us. It's the Sport Literature Association, and it's a bunch of college... It's like rodeo poets. That's right. It's about, <laughs> it's about 30 of us, and it's, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's college professors who teach uh, uh, books about sport or sport in society. So I went to that, and I am working on a, a book of short stories uh, that I'm hoping to get published, uh, but as you know, the, the market—well, get it published. Well, the market for short stories is not the—it's not the hottest market in the world. But we'll see. I, hopefully, I, I, have, I have great hope that the, the, the that the book will be published in the next year. And or two. Are you starting to think about another full-length book, uh, like you've got the Patty on the Hardwood and? Uh, 40 no. Minutes of Hell, what do you got besides your book on short stories? You got something in the works, Well, there's sure. a f I have a few ideas, and one of them is, it came out in Sports Illustrated uh, this last week. It's the, uh, if you saw the Sports Illustrated piece, I don't read Sports Illustrated uh. anymore, but the Barrio Boys was the story of the 1949 Bowie High School baseball team uh, from El Paso. They were kids in 1949 who many of them had lost brothers in World War II, Yet when they went to win the state championship in baseball, they could not find a hotel room. Now, can you imagine your brother dying in World War II, but you being denied hotel rooms all across Texas as you drove to the to win the state championship? And so the night before the state championship game, they slept on army cots underneath the, the bleachers in the stadium. Jeez. And and uh, so it's a really an, an, wow. an, it's an interesting God. story. And they were they were of an era where their coach only spoke to them in English unless he wanted the other team not to understand, and then maybe he'd shout out some instructions in Spanish. But these were guys, these were guys who uh, you know, faced a totally different world, but in some ways, maybe not. You know, the, 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 the guy, the, the last team to, from El Paso to win the state championship claimed that they were hearing the same sort of uh, you know, pig-headed racial slurs from the stands in 2009, 50 years later, we were hearing the same things, although I imagine they could get hotel rooms on the way to the game. So did you uh, are there any of those guys still around that you can yeah, they're, talk they're, to? Well, there's six of them are still around. So I've, I've only met a couple of them, but Alex Wolf wrote the story for Sports Illustrated. He's really a fine writer. Uh, he's uh, one of the best sports writers around, I think. And this, this idea of the Bowie baseball team uh, breaking down barriers seems like an interesting idea for a book to me now. I'm whether looking I could, forward to Whether it. I could ever pull it off. But you should check out the new Sports Illustrated or just get it online. I'm going to get slammed first. Yeah. Okay. You, you've been listening to a lot from the heartland on WLUW 88.7 Chicago Sound Alliance. You can listen to it anywhere in the world on WLUW.org and you can listen to earlier editions of Live from the Heartland and actually see them on YouTube.com slash Heartland Media or if you're at HeartlandCafe.com just hit the Heartland Media Project.